this is our closing session. People at, at past symposiums have always said, why don't you wrap it up? Why don't you have a closing session? So well, you asked for it, we have it. We, and we couldn't have two better qualified people to kind of wrap up Texas in World War I. Uh, our first, well, let me say this. This session is sponsored by Texas, University of Texas Press and Texas A&M University Press. Hopefully you got your wonderful two free books on World War I from Texas A&M University Press. And you got your map slash poster. After today, they will be collector's items for 20 bucks. Let's go. Uh, my first speaker is Dr. Thomas Hatfield on some effects of World War I in Texas. Uh, Dr. Hatfield is the director of the Military History Institute at the Dolph Briscoe Center for American History and Dean Emeritus of Continuing Education at UT Austin. You were also a president of Austin Community College, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> see, see, I, I know you. <laughs> uh, Dr. Hatfield is an internationally known military historian whose main professional interest is the improvement of public understanding about America's military heritage. Uh, at the Briscoe Center, he concentrates on increasing the archival collections, uh, acquiring memorabilia, photograph papers, and oral accounts. Uh, he wrote a wonderful biography on James Earl Rutter, uh, and, and a, a more recent one on Frank Denius. Denius? Denius? Denius. Denius. Yeah. Uh, please help me in welcoming Dr. Hatfield. <laughs> well, uh, uh, thank you very much. For that uh, not too generous an invitation, I mean, in introduction, but satisfactory for me. Um, I've been around the University of Texas for some half a century, and so this building in which I participated in the unfortunate design um, is, is really quite familiar to me. Um, but I don't feel like a fish out of water here today because the size of the audience is the one that I'm. I'm accustomed to usually when, when I speak, so unless I have a captive audience of students. Uh, James Harkins, uh, who the organizer, as I understand it, of the land offices symposium, of this symposium, uh, is uh, really is a uh, totalitarian. Uh, he's totalitarian with a stopwatch. He has emphasized to me again and again that I have 15 minutes and no more. So I have a handy device here uh, that, all, that is also itself is a timer. And so I am sitting it right now to start the timer. 14, it will go off 14 minutes from now. So when you hear the tower bell chimes of the University of Texas in 14 minutes, if I am in mid-sentence, that is where I stop. Okay, but it's not my fault, it's James Harkin's fault. So we start at this moment. Um, the First World War has often been described <clears throat> as um, a, uh, an incident in American history that is bookended by two cataclysmic events, the Civil War and, of course, the Second World War, which is quite different from the European experience in which the First World War or the Great War was a great horrendous experience, extraordinary experience. You only have to be in London or Paris on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in any given year uh, when everything comes to a stop, literally a stop, in London for two solid minutes. Everything, every, it's absolute quietude even in the midst of a great city. That is not our experience. But during the entire period of the First World War, Texas was rife with controversy and change. With or without the war, there were highly contentious issues, and I will enumerate several of them here. And I want to say that I took on this topic because historians have found it, in my opinion, they've been unable to define really the effects of the war on Texas, the lasting effects on Texas, uh, where they're very obvious from the Civil War or from the Second World War, with the, with the First World War, they're not so clear. But some of the contentious issues uh, at the time that Texas was in the war had to do with voting rights. And voting rights particularly for women and also for, nuisance, for, for recent arrivals, otherwise uh, known as immigrants. 
and women's suffrage would actually come to fruition as a result, as a result of the war, okay? Um, and German Americans would find themselves discriminated against at the ballot box and in other ways, especially recently arrived Germans. So voting rights was an issue during the war, contentious in the legislature. Another issue was prohibition, the conflict between the wets and the dries regarding the consumption of alcoholic beverages. And they became uh, even more contentious during the war when the, when the drives saw the development of the military camps across the state as um, sinkholes of iniquity. And if they could then sort of ban the sale of alcohol and as well as prostitution within a 10 mile radius of the military base, that would advance the cause of those who favored prohibition. So if voting rights was an issue, prohibition was an issue, there was also, as a, a trend, that is what was happening in Texas, there was the ongoing migration of people from rural areas uh, to the cities. Uh, it had begun earlier, it was accelerated during the war, uh, particularly in cities that were engaged in war industries. Uh, Beaumont, Texas uh, increased, doubled its population. Port Arthur tripled its population, and there were other very significant growths in the cities across Texas. So the migration from rural to ur from ur rural areas to urban areas. Then during the war, <clears throat> there was the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan, which was fueled by a sort of a, an expanding American nativist movement that was distrustful of Catholics, Jews, African Americans, and other sort of foreign elements. Think about our own times. It's fascinating to compare our situation today with those of 100 years ago. If you substitute the problem of drug abuse for alcohol back, back then and toss in troubles along the border and disputes between the President of the United States and the President of Mexico, then the times are, amazing, are amazingly similar. The controversies are strikingly similar. Much of the political controversy centered on a charismatic Jim Ferguson, who was elected governor in 1914 and in 1916, only to be impeached, convicted, and removed from office in 1917. All of this in the midst of a world war that was shaking the foundations of civilization. And if these transforming changes, as they occurred during the war, but historians have not been able to sort out, that is to, clar clearly, to clarify the role of the war from other causes of these developments in Texas. The changes began before the war began and they continued afterwards. But make no mistake, when Americans died from German submarine attacks in the North Atlantic, Texans were as aroused as their fellow citizens were all across the country. And when Congress declared war on Germany on April the 6th, 1917, Texans supported the measure overwhelmingly. And Texans were influential uh, with President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, they, uh, in the whole war effort, in fact, they were influential with him from the get-go. They probably made the difference in his nomination for the presidency the first time in 1912. Four, four Texans served in Wilson's war cabinet. Thomas Watt Gregory of Austin was the attorney general. David Houston was the secretary of agriculture. Albert Sidney Burleson of Austin was the postmaster general and during the war directed the government's operation of the nation's telephone and telegraph systems. And Colonel E.M. House of Austin was the, pres the president's most important private counselor and personal advisor or representative until he greatly disappointed Wilson during the Paris, Paris peace talks of 1919. Other speakers today have described the magnitude of the military training camps and the aviation schools that were established across the state. The construction of these facilities and their payrolls, both the military and civilian, that came with them were a huge boost to the economy and employment fell, fell virtually to zero, temporarily. Okay. When the war ended, 
the flow of federal money quickly declined. But while the war went on, the cost of living, that is inflation, soared at to levels not always matched by increases in income, although farm prices generally increased, especially cotton. But between 1917 and 1920, the cost of food in Texas increased by almost 75%, economists say 73.8. Clothing, the cost of clothing increased by 140%, fuel by 30%, and furniture by 130%. Within the state, the military demands of the war were obvious. Tens of thousands of soldiers stationed in the four large training camps, which had to be constructed, and as a result, the lumber industry thrived, as did road, and road and railroad construction. But it is a coincidence, but a fortunate coincidence, that the Texas Highway Department was created in 1917. It was not created in anticipation or, or as a direct cause of the First World War, but because there already was a trend underway for the state to allocate monies to counties that needed money for road construction but the highway department came into being just in time to be the receiving agency for much of the federal money for the construction of the roads that occurred during the war and the highway department could also could then allocate the monies uh, to the counties. Now, as an aside, I will say that another reason for the highway department's creation was that building roads and bridges, it's very easy to, for public officials to steal money uh, and uh, Governor uh, Jim Ferguson had a difficulty, as was alleged in the campaign of uh, 1916, distinguishing between what were public monies and what were his own, and some of those were, ro were road monies. Okay. So it also, the new aviation schools all across the state uh, gave many citizens a, f a chance to have their first view of an airplane. From a total population in the state in 1917 of just about four and a half million, almost one million Texans registered for military service and about 200,000 served in the Army, Navy, or the Marine Corps. African Americans enthusiastically supported the war and t about 25% of all soldiers from Texas were African Americans. In numbers, they were around 500, around 50,000 from a total black population in the state estimated at 740,000. In percentage terms, that translates into 6.75% of, of, of African American, of the African American population served in the military as compared to 4.4% for the total population of Texas. Some Mexicans living in Texas were not citizens and therefore not required to serve, but thousands volunteered. And several combat infantry regiments in France contained large numbers of Mexican Americans, and a, large, and a number of them were decorated for bravery, including one for the Congressional Medal of Honor. Women made their contributions to the military services, providing some 449 nurses. And of the Texans in the armed services, more than 5,000 lost their lives. And I should say that each of them has been, their name has been graved on an enormous plaque that is on the campus of the University of Texas at Austin. I say each of their names are there, notwithstanding the fact that my colleague, Dr. Lila Rakuzi has identified several African Americans whose names were left off. Here in this state, the war effort was more of an inconvenience than a hardship. To conserve food in order that more might be available for the armed forces and allies in Europe, Texans ate no pork on Thursday, Thursdays and Saturdays. On Tuesday, they ate no meat at all. And since wheat was especially scarce, 
food from wheat was not eaten on Mondays and Wednesdays. In fact, cornbread for breakfast, lunch, and dinner was the menu in many homes, no matter what day of the week. Otherwise, the support for the war effort, people took in, they had liberty loan campaigns, they bought liberty bonds, save, and savings bonds. Uh, industry expanded significantly. One of the surprising ones was the development of shipbuilding uh, and I do not refer to steel. Let me check up on my stopwatch because I don't want to get in trouble here with, with, James, with James Harkins. Because it seems. Um, I have a minute and a half left. Okay. Very interestingly, um, there an industry be, uh, uh, grew up in the state of uh, building uh, wooden ships. Uh, and at least 10 were completed and 12 were underway at the time the war ended. There was a shortage of steel, and Texas had a, an abundance of yellow pine as well as the sawmills to produce the ship timbers. And so these shipyards uh, for building uh, developed in uh, Beaumont, Port Arthur, Houston, and, and in Corpus Christi. Um, someone mentioned earlier today uh, that um, the, uh, the new oil fields and explorations about uh, Ranger, Texas, I think Jim H Hodgson mentioned it. You may not have heard of the great oil fields that were around, again, around Ranger, uh, Desdemona, Nimrod. You've probably never heard of those towns because you can't find them on the map anymore. But Ranger, for example, which is the larger of the towns in the area there, the population increased in about 18 months from 1,000 to 30,000. And those, those were symbol, symbolized the expansion and the development of uh, the oil and gas during the war. Uh, women's suffrage, women's suffrage finally made it, fin finally made it, uh, uh, would, President Wilson declared it was an important war measure. It didn't get through the, leg the amendment, the 19th Amendment uh, was approved by the legislature in a special session that met in 1919, and Texas became the uh, first of the southern states to ratify that uh, women's suffrage, and it became law in the following year. And so that concludes exactly uh, what now, 14 minutes and, thir and 30 seconds. <laughs> but to tell you that if you want to know, try to understand what happened in Texas, or the consequences of the war of World War I in Texas, it's difficult uh, during the, it's difficult to sort out uh, what was caused by the war and what otherwise uh, was happening and would happen uh, in a very period of dynamic growth within our state. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hatfield, for those concise and timely comments. Our last speaker for this uh, daily session is Mike Visconage. Mike is the one of the directors of the Texas World War I Centennial Commemoration Association. He has so far wrangled 250 organizations to somehow celebrate World War I uh, or educate us about it. Mike was a, an officer in the United States Marine Corps and Reserve, retiring as a colonel. Uh, besides operational assignments, he was a historian in Iraq and both 2003 and 2007, 2008. Uh, he has been in private industry for the last 20 years in positions in leadership in healthcare, franchising, and construction. He has authored over 30 articles in a book on Marine Corps aviation. Mike will tell us about the centennial commemoration of Texas and Texans in the Great War. Please help me in welcoming Mike. Well, we've had an awesome day, right, of hearing lots of great speakers. Thank you all. Thanks to the GLO for putting this on. This is exactly the kind of thing that um, 
that, that is awesome for the World War I centennial. So you guys deciding to have this and putting together the pieces to make it all happen, uh, this is exactly what we're talking about. So um, I got involved with this about two and a half years ago and we built this coalition uh, with many others. Just, it's a grassroots effort to help commemorate the role of Texas and Texans in the Great War. Um, and in the course of that experience, have made very many interesting contacts, one of which was uh, we received some photographs uh, from, um, from some French citizens who had already been involved with the World War I Centennial for some time over there, and they uh, provided us with some images. And what I, the point I want to make is, you know, in the war zone, mundane things take on a unique significance. Um, and if you've experienced war, you know this. If you've read about war, you know this. And it's that uh, things like a hot meal, a shower, a letter from home. But graffiti is something that happens in a war zone too. But what I would tell you about graffiti in a war zone, because I've seen it in a modern war zone, it has a different feel than the graffiti you see day in and day out if you walk into you know, a public space and you see something because it is the men and women who, are, who don't know if they're gonna come back again. And they are saying to us, I was here, remember me. So these images made by Texans, and if you, it's a little difficult to see all the, the detail, but I wanna highlight that on the left, for instance, is a Marine from Houston um, who was uh, PSC Albert Decoe. And he fought at San Mihal and the Meuse Argonne Offensive in the 6th Machine Gun Battalion of the 2nd Division that you heard about earlier. Um, on the far right is um, uh, Alfred uh, Lenné, who was from Fredericksburg. And in the middle, this was the emblem, if you can't quite make it out, for the 90th Division, right? Uh, one of the uh, National Army Divisions. So this speaks to us about, to, we sat here and we listened and we picked up some great information today. You may have come to the table already having a lot of knowledge about, uh, about the Great War, but what I wanted to highlight is, hey, what do we do with that information from here? And what I wanna ask you is take away from this uh, the idea that I wanna ask you to go forward from here. And you have your contacts, you have your organizations, um, you have your communities where there are people out there that don't know anything about the contribution of Texas and Texans in the Great War, which was huge, as you heard in a, a many different aspects today. Um, so take forth and take, asking you to take some action. So, but what is that action? And what is going on across the country? Well, first of all, we are part of the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission uh, program. The Centennial Commission was established by an act of Congress late in 2013. And uh, unfortunately, they weren't given a bag of money. There was no funding that went to it, but the organization stood up, the, and there are commissioners that were appointed across the country. The one that has oversight for Texas is actually a San Antonian, retired Major General uh, Alfred Valenzuela. But the members of the commission in D.C. have done some great things, even on no budget. They've borrowed people from other federal agencies who are sitting in to, to make this thing happen. But they've put together some great resources that we can get at, as well as some, some goals at the national level. One of their goals is just to help build educational programs for uh, students. So that, again, how do we teach the present generation and the next generation about the Great War? and also creating a national database of World War I monuments around the country because they realize there is no such thing. And probably the, their other goals, but the last significant one I would highlight is they are also raising money for a national World War I monument in DC of which, believe it or not, there is not one. So those are some of the national goals. But what they asked early on when they established this commission is, hey, states, we're asking, we're reaching out to all the states asking each state to to create their own centennial commemoration and to stay in touch with us and so we can help communicate these things. So we start off with that being our reference point of, okay, we want to create a commemoration for Texas. And that has, that has been uh, our starting point. So we have been fortunate to uh, start building this thing early in 20, 2015. Again, it's a grassroots volunteer nonprofit effort there's nobody who works on any of this that, that gets a paycheck in any way, shape, or form. We do it out of a love and a passion for it. But our simple mission of the Texas World War I Centennial Commemoration is to 
be able to communicate, coordinate, and commemorate, right? Because we just got to tell people about it out the front. That's what we've been doing a lot of. But the coordination part, we've been, we've been putting together resources that just help organizations and groups do things to help that commemoration of Texas and Texans in the Great War. Um, how do we do that? We've been doing outreach. Again, we, we have information. We have uh, a, a rather extensive web suite that's, site that's a great resource. And in that website, you'll find connections to all kinds of things, everything from the, a book list about books about Texas and Texans of the Great War, and we have a table with some of those things out there today, to, um, uh, to the various sites around the state, to there was already a great database that, that one of our contacts had already created about all the many, many monuments around the state to our World War I veterans, that we already have a database, but how to get at many of these things. Part of the process of building it th this then was also um, seeking and finding great partners. So in pursuing uh, the official channels of the state and communicating with the governor's office, we were very excited when, they, uh, uh, when the governor appointed the Texas Historical Commission as, uh, as the lead agency for the state to, to spearhead um, the World War I centennial. That is not to say that there are lots of other key partners like the GLO who are also have a role to play in the centennial, have also done things and it's been great to be in touch with many of those folks. But our other stakeholders in this outreach effort um, have also included museums, veterans and civic groups have been key, key contacts of ours, as you might imagine. The VFW uh, and the American Legion. The American Legion was founded strictly by really veterans of, of the World War I. The VFW had existed a little before that, but was greatly enhanced by veterans joining that organization. But schools, military units, um, uh, county historical commissions, and again, some of the other key state agencies that have been gracious enough to engage with us on this. So again, up to this point, as Mark said, we, we have about 250 organizations and about 700 individuals who, who we have some connection with in one way, shape, or, or form who are either have done something or are looking to do something to be part of this commemoration. And we have some great resources, a few of these that you see up here just to represent that. So what is the commemoration? If what I'm asking, if you do nothing else today, if you go home and, and think about, hey, can, can I help communicate this message? What, is that, what does that commemoration look like? Well, to give you a sense of it, let me tell you a little bit about some of the things that have happened already and where we go from here. So some of the things that have ha happened already is it's been a huge and interesting variety because also, as you heard Tom Hatfield say, this, this, there was the war element, right? And it's easy to immediately look at the military aspect, but this is a time of huge social change for Texas, right? So the story isn't just about soldiers who went to war. That's an important and critical and obvious piece, and we want to cover that. But even just the other things that were happening, huge time of social change, the role of women. It was the first time women in uniform serving in the military. The role of minorities that was just because America was the way it was at the time was overlooked at the time, but it's an opportunity, and you heard about some of that uh, in, in the, the um, subject matter today and being able to focus on some of those things. But the things that have happened so far, some of those things are, that just exist in Texas because they're cool artifacts. You saw a picture on the previous slide, the USS Texas, sole remaining dreadnought, right? That thankfully is still afloat despite Harvey. Um, these kind of things, but Hangar 9 at Brooks City Base, what used to be Brooks Air Force Base there, which used to be Brooks Field from World War I, is the sole remaining wooden World War I hangar of its type in the country, they, and Brook City Base just spent two and, two and a half million dollars restoring that site back to its, its original state. So there are existing sites, but other things that have been happening too is THC has done a number of interesting things. You probably saw their table out there. They published a special edition of their medallion. Uh, there is the mobile app piece where you can go to 30 places around Texas and tie in with the mobile app and see what was going on then during World War I, as well as about 10 videos that are part of that series. But just from grassroots efforts, things like St. Mary's University, one of the professors there over the last two years has had her students developing micro documentaries about things that happened in World War I and many of those specific to what happened in Texas during World War I. And you'll find a link to some of those on our, uh, on our website. Um, but there have been many, many exhibits at museums small and large around the state. Uh, there have been concerts, there have been other publications, and that has been very exciting. Specifically, 
at the start of the centennial period, which began in April of this year, when America's entry involved in the war, and will go through June of 2019, that is when ultimately our troops returned and we dealt with many of the returning veteran issues of that time and parades were held in town and the, and the uh, Treaty of Versailles was, uh, was signed. So it will go through, tr through 2019. Um, but on the, on the kickoff week between that and early April, there were over two dozen activities around the state, beginning with the state legislature, both the House and the Senate signing uh, a resolution recognizing the, the centennial period beginning, but also everything from large and small. In small communities, um, uh, does, who knows where Mason, Texas is? Do I have anyone in Mason? So I believe there was, in the county, there was a wreath laying ceremony there on the, on the one end. There were special exhibits, there were concerts. Even down to the Freedom Riders motorcycle group having a commemorative ride in North Texas at the National Cemetery there as part of that uh, recognition of the start of the centennial period. Okay, so that's kind of what's happened before, just to give you some ideas in your head. But where, where do we go now? What does the centennial look like now? Well, simply in three words, people, places, poppies. Because there are people in your communities or maybe in the organizations that you belong to that the heritage that there were World War I veterans who served there, or people who made some contribution to your community or your organization after the war, who were World War I veterans or involved in World War I? How do we recognize them? How do we pull out their story and tell that to people today? Places, those historic places, I've mentioned a couple of them, but they are all across the state, right? And the idea of how do we help people understand how significant this was by drawing more attention to those historic places. And poppies, Poppies is kind of just a, 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 a no-brainer about how simple a commemoration can be in the sense that um, poppies were, were the, the flower that bloomed on the battlefields, right? Even when all the soil was upturned by shelling and nothing else existed, right? But this idea of the act of planting poppies of some organization, like several of our DAR partner chapters have already had these poppy planting ways of tying in with this idea of how do we commemorate the Great War. Um, but we can provide you, one of our goals again is to be a resource, we can provide you with a short list of off the shelf ideas that if you don't know what you wanna do but you think your organization might wanna do something or your community might get involved, reach out to us and I'm gonna show you some contact information just as the wrap up but the idea is we're here to help show you what those easy off the shelf things do but again this is something that it takes you or the person next to you or both of you or whatever it is, if anything happens, it's because someone in this audience decided this was important and that those guys who put that graffiti up there, that they were trying to tell us, I was here, remember me. So that's what I'm asking is go forth and try and take something away from this and pass the word, tell someone else about how significant this was to us. So these are the quick contacts. And you can, um, you can most readily reach us on our website, and that's kind of a great starting point. But if you were a Facebook person, if you do nothing else today to help us with our communication mission, if you can go forward and you can like us and follow us on Facebook, that's great. That's a channel where we can put information. The other thing on our website, too, is the calendar feature. So we, you go to the calendar feature, and you'll see there, is, there are eight things going on today around the state either existing exhibits or this right down to this event that are on our calendar. If you decide you're going to do something or you've got something already in the works or on your calendar, let us know. We'll put it on that calendar and we'll show you how to feed it up to the national calendar as well. So part of this, again, is about getting the word out to people and we'll put it on our Facebook page to just help further get the word out. By all means, you're welcome to um, email us at that email address. We also have the table right outside. I have a, I have a, a um, rack card that has the same information on it but you're welcome to email us, whatever's easiest for you, so we can kind of tee you up with any information that'd be helpful to you. And once you get in touch with it, if you've got an event, we're happy to have you use, endorse it with the Texas World War I Centennial logo, and we'll coordinate use of the National World War I Centennial Commission logo, just to give you that added credibility. So, again, it's about our fellow Texans who, who heard that call, who went and served their nation, and uh, over 5,100 of them who did, who did not come back. And again, a few, of them, a few of them left their mark, right, of saying, I was here, remember me. Thank you.